I'll first take you to the NPM site to show you an overview of the module we'll be installing and using. All right, and I'll just type in gamepad here in the search box. And then it's the first listing on the results page. Now, as you can see, it's pretty simple to install. So let's go ahead and run that command before going any further. I went ahead and created a demo directory here to house the module, as well as the source code for the sample application I'll be running in the remainder of the video. So I'll just install the package to this directory by running npm install gamepad. Now it's not mentioned anywhere in the gamepad documentation, at least not that I could find anyway, but gamepad actually has a dependency on Python 2.7, so you will also need to have that installed on your machine. If you have multiple versions of Python installed, like 2.7 and say 3.5 like I do, you will have to add an extra argument to the npm install command, which is dash dash python equals python 2.7. I'll be using the WebStorm IDE here to write the demo code, which certainly is not a requirement, so feel free to use whatever text editor or IDE with which you're most comfortable. I won't judge, just don't use Notepad. I might judge you then. Kidding. But seriously, don't use it. Anyway, before switching back to the NPM site, I'll create a test.js file here that will act as a simple demo application. And back on the site, you can see that the sample code here is pretty straightforward, and that's because there isn't much to the gamepad package. There's certainly a lot that goes on under the hood, don't get me wrong, but in terms of the module with which we'll be interacting, gamepad offers us six functions and emits five different events, which you can see here just below the sample code. I'm actually just going to be hijacking, or mm, kindly borrowing, we'll say, the sample code here to kick off the development by pasting it into the test.js file I created just a moment ago. Now before I kick this off, I want to explain a bit about what's going on here. The first step, of course, is to pull in the gamepad module by calling require, and then gamepad needs to be initialized, which is done by calling the init function. As a part of the initialization process, this call to init tells gamepad to check for any devices that may already be connected to the computer. The next chunk grabs the number of devices that gamepad has found to be connected, and then logs each of the devices to the console. Although if you look closely, you'll actually see a bug here. The device at index function actually takes in an integer corresponding to the position of the device you want to retrieve from its collection of connected devices, so I'll need to plug in the i variable here as well. The next two lines are used to tell gamepad to continuously check for events from any of the connected devices, which include button presses and joystick movements, as well as check for any devices that may have been connected to, or even disconnected from, the computer since gamepad was initialized. You can see here that the first call is made every 16 milliseconds, and that the second call is made every half a second. I think these values were chosen in order to get as close to real time as possible, but maybe checking for the attached and removed devices every half a second is too frequent for your application, so you can certainly adjust these interval values to whatever you'd like to suit your needs. The last three blocks of this sample are very similar in nature, and that they all handle events from the devices. The first one is used to handle movements from any of the axis controls on the controller, which include the left and right triggers, as well as the left and right joysticks. Each device connected to your computer gets its own device, or session ID, which is always the first argument emitted from each of the events. This way, if you have multiple controllers connected, you can tell them all apart with this ID. The next argument here is also an ID, and this one corresponds to the particular axis control that triggered the event. The final argument passed in is the value corresponding to the position of the axis when the event was emitted. The values for each axis falls in the range of negative 1 to positive 1. Now according to the npm docs, the gamepad author states that the move event also sends along the previous value of the axis, as well as a timestamp corresponding to when the event was emitted. He left those out of the sample for whatever reason, so just know that those are available as well if you need them. The last two blocks here are pretty much the same, except that one block handles the up event, which is emitted when a button is released on the controller, and the other handles the down event, which is emitted whenever a button is pressed on the controller. Just like with the move handler, each of these events takes in an ID, which corresponds to the ID of the device or controller that triggered the event, as well as a number, which identifies the button that was pressed or released. The gamepad docs also state that these events pass along a timestamp argument, which was not added to either handler in the sample code, so just be aware that you can take that in as well if you'd like. Alright, now I'll just fire up the sample code here to show you what the output looks like if you run all of this. I've already turned my controller on so that the first for loop would actually have something to log to the console, which is what this chunk of output is here. 
The zero on the left hand side is actually the value of the i or index variable used in the for loop, so that is not coming from the gamepad module itself. Each device is set up as an object with a number of different properties. The device ID is the unique number assigned to each connected device. It's just a sequential number starting with zero and incremented by one for each subsequent connected device. This is the ID that is passed to each of the event handlers so that you know which device triggered the events. The description property is pretty self-explanatory, and it just gives you human readable text of the type of controller connected. The next two IDs, product ID and vendor ID, are what you can use to know exactly which type of device is connected, aside from looking at the description of course. The vendor ID corresponds to the manufacturer of the controller, and the product ID identifies a specific device or controller made by that manufacturer. The last two properties, axis states and button states, give you a snapshot of the values of each of the axis and button controls at the time when the device object was logged. Now just below the device, you can see some logs for the move event handler. This is actually some rogue output, as I was not moving any of the axis controls when this fired up. This is sort of a bug, or defect in my mind at least, of GamePad, and pretty much happens every time a new controller is detected. GamePad just spits out a value for each of the axis controls. Kind of annoying, but fairly easy to work around if need be. Now for each of these, you can see the ID of the controller that triggered the events, which corresponds to the device ID property up above. Next is the axis ID, which tells us which axis control triggered the event. And you can see here that the event was triggered for all of the six different axis controls. The last part is the value of each axis control at the time the event was triggered. Again, axis values fall in the range of negative one to positive one, as indicated here. All right, now if I press some of the buttons, we should see the up and down events being fired as well. I'll just go ahead and press the X button and see what happens. You can see that device ID zero triggered the events and that the number 12 was passed to the handlers, which identifies the button being pressed. As you can imagine, writing applications against this number may not be straightforward or intuitive, as it's not obvious that the X button is identified with a number 12. You can always write some code, though, that maps the IDs to the respective button names for more meaningful output if you prefer. All right, and I'll just press a few more buttons here so that you can see the output for those as well, which should look similar to the X button. Okay, and now just to demonstrate the full range of an axis control, I'll slowly press and release the right trigger. Now when a trigger control is used, negative one is the value of the control's resting state, zero corresponds to the trigger being halfway down, and you'll get a value of positive one when the trigger is fully pressed. And of course, as the trigger is in the process of being released, the values will go from positive one to zero and back to negative one when the trigger is fully released. This should give you a small taste of what the gamepad package can do. As we've seen, it's a generic library that can be used with multiple types of controllers or joysticks so that you can change things up a bit and offer users the ability to interact with your JavaScript applications in some pretty cool ways. Thanks for watching.